Let's go. So, um, welcome everyone to episode 52, our, our sort of last of, of a year's worth of episodes on The Bounce. And um, we are delighted to to welcome Helen, Helen Banwell, who uh, is one of the, uh, she's uh, based at Univers- uh, University of South Australia. Uh, does an awful amount, done an awful amount of research in the field of flat foot, both adult and paediatric, although today is going to be very much paediatric, and also foot orthoses. So we're going to really tease out a bit about the paediatric flat foot, a bit about uh, orthoses, when to use, when not to use, and that kind of beautiful grey area that we find ourselves in clinically. And I should add, and it's important to add, that Helen isn't just a, a researcher slash lecturer um, she also works in private practice. So she's not just going to sit here and tell us about all of the research. She's going to give us those, those pearls that we can take into practice when we're dealing with tricky decisions in our own mind or perhaps um, tricky parents. And I think there'll be themes that come up that we spoke to Kylie about and Alicia about and Nina about around things like assessment and, and things like um, parents. Parents seem to come up quite a lot when we're talking, talking. So thank you so much for joining us, Helen. We're, we're, we're delighted to have you. And, um, We've had lo- loads of questions come in, and my only concern is we don't have time to get through all of them. And obviously, Craig's going to keep an eye on the the questions and see if anything comes in um, that's relevant as we go. Um, probably the one I'll start with because it's although we're going to talk about flat feet and uh, orthoses in the, in the paediatric patient, um, I'll start with this one because it's it's sort of not so much about that, but it, it, it is something that someone asked, and we've touched on it before, and I think it's a great thing to repeat, and that is. Um, the Gallup um, Pro Forma, which I know that you were one of the authors on, on that paper with lead author Simone, and and, um, and if if you could just for our uh, for our listening audience that aren't up to speed, and I'm sure m- most of them probably are, but could you just talk us around a bit about this and and um, and what it is and how we can can and should use it in clinic. Uh, I'm pleased you brought that one up. I think out of all of my publications, I've been incredibly proud about the Gallup because um, it was, I think, the first paper after my PhD. uh, And it came out of um, some discussions I had with Kylie at at one of the conferences and then her um, uh, colleague, Simone, getting on board and just leading it. And what it was about was that we... In podiatry, my biggest fear when I was going into my PhD was that if we took the one person, adult, child, whatever, that went off to see a podiatrist for something around biomechanics, that they would get assessed in 50,000 different ways and then they would potentially get three or four, five, 10, 20 different types of orthotics depending on the practitioner. So consistency was my biggest fear at that point and um, Simone Godlover developed that to kind of counteract that within paediatric assessment so the whole study is it's just a brilliant concept so what we did well what Simone um, drove was looked at all of the different assessment forms that were available to us so all of the public universities the teaching institutes the um, private practices that would share took out every single assessment that we could see out of those pro formers and then uh, got this panel of experts together and sent it all out to the panel and said, right, rank these, like, you know, tell us which ones are important, which ones we need to do. Um, And then not just got their opinion on it, but then looked for the evidence to back back it up. So what we needed was that for every outcome or for every assessment that we're doing in the Gallup, we know that there's normative data, or for most of them, there's a couple that we couldn't get normative data for. But that we know that when you use the Gallup, which is just a really simple couple of page pro forma, tick and flick, fill in pro forma, that you're looking at what is the best method of assessing that particular um, either joint range of motion, neurological factor or whatever else. And it just came together as this beautiful, concise um, uh, document and we published it as a Word doc. So you can literally pick it up and do what I did in um, the practice um, is I just dropped it straight into the middle of my existing pro forma and just took out the bits around it that no longer were needed. But I've still got my first page with all my other stuff on there and I've still got some measures at the end which have no 
evidence behind them, but I can't seem to let them go. Um, you know, things like the riders. I, st I still do a riders test uh, when I'm looking at hip stuff, and there's no evidence behind it. It's a pretty dodgy me measure, but you know, I can't I can't seem to drop it. So you know, I just sort of and literally plucked it in there. But at least when we're all reporting, if you use the Gallup, we know that there's a fair amount of consistency between us. And so the theory being that if I see a five-year-old now and you see a five-year-old in three years, if you call for those notes, you've got a history and it should be a consistent history to what you're now measuring. So there's lots of value in it. One, it's a nice little cheat sheet for you to follow and not have to think about. But two, it does increase, you know, our, our um, uh, you know, culpability between us we can we can kind of work it out a bit better so the Gallup yeah that's an excellent excellent document get on it tweet it yeah I agree and, and I certainly speak to colleagues who and I'm one of them by the way who don't see as much pediatrics as many and and they, they refer to this as, as as something that just really saves their bacon because you know you see that you see that there's a, a, a pediatric case on your list just after your tea break so you spend that 15 minutes just you know it's on JFAR it's open access there it is and, and they're great to go so I've spoken to so many people that have, that have been hugely thankful for that so I think it's an awesome paper um let's talk about some of your other awesome papers because that is far from far from the only one that you are you have authored and um we'll get stuck straight into the pediatric flat foot and while, while we're talking about flat foot, we should probably talk about terminology. So um, you have talked about, uh, you, you published a systematic review that talked about how we measure and, and, and uh, this sort of phenomena. And um, how, I think it, it then comes into the realms of, um, yeah, and you say in the title there, don't you, how are we measuring it and are we getting it right? Mm -hmm. um, could, you, could you summarize that paper for us before, and then we'll kind of build the discussion off the back of that? Um, the paper was it was uh, started by an honours student a few years ago, and then um, I took over the systematic review part of it. Was what I was concerned about um, was that we were getting a lot of conflicting information. So, uh, for example, Angela Evans had just come out with something at a conference about um, BMI and flat feet in children, so obesity and flat feet in children, where her Findings contra oh, I can't speak this morning. Um, um, argued against. What is that word? Contradicted. contradicted. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, uh, a whole heap of other papers that had come out with a really clear correlation. And when Angela measured with the flat foot, um, sorry, the um, FPI, she found a very, very different outcome. And that makes perfect sense if you think about the way that a lot of papers measure flexible flat foot is via a um, footprint. So if you think about, you know, popping a little footprint, either tracing around it, taking a photo, however you gain a footprint, it's a 2D construct trying to measure a 3D foot. Um, and it makes perfect sense to me that if these kids are carrying a little bit more adipose tissue, then that footprint is going to appear flatter. So I was a bit worried that, we were making a lot of decisions that, you know, potentially guided, a, you know, even policy and health policy around something that just didn't sound right to me. And so Angela has worked tire tirelessly at that. And she's really, I think, proven um, beyond, you know, any doubt that there's no correlation between obesity in children and and, and, and flat feet, um, but it's still getting out there. So that was the whole point behind that systematic review is let's have a really good look to see what were, what were the psychometric properties. Are they valid? Are they reliable as measures? And when we kind of nutted through it all, we found that there was only three that had had any validation or reliability testing in a children's population. And the FPI was certainly one of them. There's the Schipau smirak Index um, that also got a bit of a gurney and the Staheli Arch Index. All of them came with their own cautions. Um, so as a wrap up from that paper, I think, you know, annoyingly as a wrap up from a lot of papers that we do, there's more research required. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a surprise. Um, uh, but the take home message for us was, you know, use the, use the foot posture index um, until we can, you know, either develop something better or, or um, you know, really now home the population. Uh, data on that on the other ones a little bit better so the foot posture yeah. at the end of the day great and and but, just a little sorry great god yeah, it's, like, it's, it's also based on the premise that posture is actually a problem but oh yeah, yeah exactly exactly <laughs> and that yes and that's a really uh you know that's that's where i think we're 
we're still struggling as a um, profession to try and work out. And there's people that are well ahead and people that are still catching up. But when it comes to posture, posture alone is no major drama. And that was the also the outcome of that paper was at the end of it. I think we need to understand posture better. I think we need to have better normative data. And we've just put in for a massive grant, Hayley Uden, um, who's just uh, had a little third bubba. So she's on maternity leave at the moment, but she's um, put together, she's principal on a grant that we're looking to try and measure foot posture across like massive, massive um, population data so that we can get percentiles. Mm -hmm. um, for posture because I think that's what we're missing is a lot of that background stuff that will tell us what is within expected limits and what's outside of expected limits and that needs to be our kind of base start to then go right well if you're outside of expected limits what's the consequence um, you know and so this the study that we're looking at will follow these kids across a few years and uh, and see if we can start to get some predictors together about when when does it all go horribly wrong yeah we um we're always taught not to not to think of kids as as mini adults you know it's like something i remember being being taught they're not just they're not just small adults so we shouldn't just take what we would rightly or wrongly consider normal and abnormal in an adult and then bring that down to children and, and um i know you're familiar with the work of, of the, the, the commentary that stuart morrison and the, the great foundations team published in jfar and they talked about sort of revising um revising the dialogue i think was the, the word they used in the title and they, they talked about sort of the terminology of flat foot in itself kind of over medicalizing what is often a very normal um observation yes. for, for various stages of development um I, I'm, I'm sure you you don't have any sort of opinion that, that that is different to that but um could you just sort of summarize for people what sort of language we should or shouldn't be using in our clinics because if we're going to introduce change it feels like now's the time to do it and, and maybe in future we'll we'll see change but I mean, should we completely avoid using the term paediatric flat foot is that the take home from that kind of commentary or, or is it a bit grayer than that i i think it's um a bit more it's multi-layered because i think the the reality is that we're using the adults as kind of the, the medium to what we judge our kids on and that needs to change. Um, so it's, it's, I always say to the students, it's a little bit like having to shift the entire thought process down by gradients, you know, sort of once they're sort of six and below, you kind of have to reshift what you consider, even in rear foot posture. Um, I tend to try and avoid the term normal as much as possible, but I do find myself saying to parents, look flat, you know, this foot posture is perfectly normal and trying to avoid that flat stuff. But it's how, you know, parents expect you to use the term flat and it's certainly how they come in discussing it. So I think it's just a matter of trying to realign what is normal. Um, and, and, you know, I talk in terms of typically developing um, uh, when I use these rather than normal, but um, it really is just a matter of trying to readjust that, that just because a posture looks flatter than an adult, it doesn't make it flat. Um, but still, and here's the grey area, you're going to have kids that do have flat feet. They are, you know, for, for, for children of their age, their foot is flatter than it should be. Um, so I think there needs to be a little bit of a, um, a clarity and it would be great if we could have a consensus statement and there's a study for you, but have a consensus statement with, you know, Stuart and, and Chris who are doing such excellent work at the, um, at the Great Foundation stuff. They're going to really define that infant foot development. Uh, I'm really excited about the stuff that they're doing. I think once that they've got a whole heap of population data, it would be fabulous um, to try and get a consensus statement about when do we use the term flat foot and when do we avoid it like the plague. Mm. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit about the AC, we'll, we'll keep using the term flat foot for, the, for this episode, if that's okay, just for ease. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll talk about the asymptomatic flat foot shortly and we got to we got to dedicate quite a bit of time to that because that's where it gets really gray and challenging clinically at least um but what about the the pediatric case that comes into clinic with pain so someone you know, we always say and we have we have this problem in adults as well i guess but someone comes in um in pain and in a pronated position with, with a pronated foot posture how do we can we uh, ever sort of tease out and unpick whether they're in pain because of that foot posture? Oh, you yeah. know, and, and it kind of feeds into the question, when do we intervene? I guess that's kind of the point I want to get to. 
we um uh, we did a, a, a Delphi study on exactly um, trying to get some consensus, and it's only consensus, so it's a I need to just state that up front that any Delphi paper that I've been involved in, other than the Gallup, doesn't have any evidence behind it. It's opinion, um, but for me. If I'm dealing with children, it depends on the age and um, the capabilities of the children because a lot of the ones that I work with, I work in a uh, predominantly NDIS practice. So every child arrives with some form of, um, you know, special requirement uh, and some form of diagnosis. So, and quite high end at times. So there's a, you know, a whole group of, of people that are even more um, sometimes difficult to unpick. But that standard child, the same as what I do in an adult is I tend to try and look at it. And if you can see an obvious reason, and it is still a crystal ball, because you're looking at it going, well, that looks as if it should be causing the pain. Um, but sometimes it's a, a matter of trialing it. So I use a lot of tape uh, to sort of to mimic what a orthotic will do or to mimic a sort of, you know, trying to get that, that foot to roll out a little bit more. Um, so I use a lot of trial products to see and send them off for a week to see if that kind of helps the pain. Um, and then you, you, you have an idea. And I'm a great believer in prefabricated orthotics as well. I, I very rarely use a, a custom. I can't remember the last customized. Oh, no, that's not true. I do. I, in the special needs kids, sometimes you have to. But uh, for, for sort of typically developing children, I use a lot of prefabricated orthotics. And you can kind of pop them into their shoes, pop a little cover over them and get them to walk backwards and forwards and see if it feels better. And I think, you know, that's that's... I'd love to hear if someone else has got a better idea, but that's that's my way of dealing with it. Just a little bit of a suck it and see. Yeah, just a follow up to your comment about prefab v uh, custom. Um, just because I've heard you say that before on a podcast that you did with Footwork and George Murley, uh, and I think that was a, a while ago now. But clearly, your your mind's in the same place. Is that an economic? A financial decision on behalf of the patient? Is it based on the evidence we have? Is it a blurring of the two? It's um, pretty much, uh, we don't have a great deal of evidence for customised orthotics at all in children, with the exception of um, in juvenile arthritis, uh, where they, they looked at, um, you know, using a UCBL, you know, the high flange devices. Um, and I'm not even completely convinced they weren't uh, just sort of mildly customised. Uh, I tend to use prefabs for ease and also because the evidence doesn't support me using customised. And it's interesting you bring up that financial thing because the one that I struggle with is when mum and dad have got private health insurance and, uh, you know, they'll come in with a with a child and they'll, they may not be aware. I'm not always aware because I don't know all the tables and what pays what. But sometimes you're in that position where you think a customised, they'll actually get something back. Whereas a prefab, they won't. So sometimes it isn't so much of a financial decision, but more about what am I trying to, to, to achieve with these orthotics. And unless I could, I've got a really unusual situation that won't be controlled by a prefab, then I don't think we're doing anybody any favours by going off down that expensive um, expensive route for no, no um, gain, and particularly around the evidence. I think it's harder to justify nowadays because the evidence is pretty clear that prefabs, as long as they're controlling properly, should be your choice. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, before we move on to the asymptomatic, because I've got a feeling that one's going to, we can, we can easily talk about that all, all, on a whole, all night. Um, another question that came in and it was about sort of treating the, the symptomatic flat foot and it was the the age old sort of discussion of conservative versus surgical oh. and and to clarify it was a surgeon that sent me this a very good friend he's been on an episode before uh, ryan he sent me a text and he and he, and he he's fully you know, like like all good surgeons you know only really resorting to surgery when all conservative measures have failed and what his question he wanted me to ask you was at what stage would you consider conservative management has failed? How how long do you give it? How many how many how many attempts do you give it? Um, that was his first. He's actually got two questions, but that was his first of two for you. Um, well, I tend to have a a uh, and again, there's no evidence behind this. It's just what I do. well, I think there's there's logic behind it. I have a tendency to to if I cannot physically move a foot back into a, um, a usable alignment. So if you've got a kid that is so flat-footed and it's the transverse motion that, that generally, um, you know, even in adults, it's an adult-acquired flat foot, isn't it, that really does 
your head in that you, you know, trying to control. If I can't physically move that foot, um, you know, with some muscular help from the kids, you know, roll your foot out, roll your foot out. If you can't get it back to it looks, you know, somewhat under, the foot looks somewhat under the leg, um, then you're probably barking up the wrong tree. My process with children with lots of transverse plane motion is to use a flange device and you know the higher the better some in some cases um but sometimes you know you'll put a little flange device over the top and they just literally lump over the side uh and you know they're the the kids that you do worry about and you know conservatively you would go a standard device then a a, a um, transverse uh, flange device or a, a medial and a lateral flange device a high boot um and then you're pretty much looking at let's keep you comfortable until such point that you're old enough, you know, to potentially look at surgeries. Yeah. You actually answered his second question uh, there, which was uh, any tips for conservative management of the transverse plane dominant flat foot, the ones that give him, give all of us the most challenges and probably the ones that he ends up operating on the most. So you've pretty much killed both his questions. That's perfect. Yeah. He promises just, me he's going to listen. Just, just on that, that, that this issue, like, I mean, I agree. And, and Ian knows how I manage those transverse plane ones, you know, um, send them to your enemies, but the, <laughs> the, they've always been a challenge because they slide off the device. But it, even some of the stuff you're just talking about previously, Helen, about measuring posture, like the, the say the transverse plane flat foot is very different to the sagittal plane flat foot. You know, they're, they're almost two totally different beasts. And a lot of these measures aren't taking that into account. Not at all. Yeah. At all. And that's, and I think that that's the thing that we're really conscious about is that, you know, we can look and pull apart all of these measures and whatever else, but they are all either based on a static foot or a footprint. So, and, and we know, and that's coming back to the gallop. If you have a look at the gallop pro forma, one of the areas, a whole area is dedicated to gait analysis, but there is absolutely no evidence behind it. But all of us on the, and the entire Delphi panel, panel agreed that that's the bit that you've got to base it on is how do these feet function and how do they work when they're actually asked to work? Um, and that's what you've got to take into consideration. Yeah. Um, Helen, we've just had a question from Robin. Um, I guess touching on the fact we've been talking about the preference for prefabs in general from, from yourself. Is there a preferable uh, EBP, which I guess is evidence-based practice, uh, off the shelf orthosis to prescribe? Uh, I don't think there's a particular one. There was a, a study that um, a long time ago that used Vasily uh, and compared it to, that was the D. Whitford study. It was done here in Adelaide um, on children at the women's and children's that they looked at, they took a whole group of children that were, um, measured as flat foot and gave three groups. So we had a customized, a prefab and a control group and measured these kids over 12 months for pain and function concerns. And surprise, surprise, they all got better. Um, none of them were symptomatic, well, very few of them were symptomatic going in. Um, but they used a facility versus a customized device. Uh, so, um, and they both improved in the same way. So I suppose you could say there's a the facility but to be honest i think it could have probably have been any prefabricated device as long as it does what you're looking for um and i have preferences we all have preferences um to which ones we like and i after the webinar that i did i had a whole heap of, of people sort of sending me emails saying which ones do you like um and you know there are uh, the transverse plain people you know i quite like an algios device the, the feet in motion and that kind of stuff but i think ultimately it's just about finding the one that you can work with uh and that you find um you know uh, sort of suits suits your clientele yeah, it's, it's yeah. like asking which is the best prefab i mean the best prefab is the one that has the design features that you need for that particular foot in the story um you know like it's people uh people like the uh people like to be told what one to buy they don't they i think they really and, uh, do they really do yeah so it's probably about time we moved on to the the um the asymptomatic mm -hmm. uh, pediatric flat foot because i think most of us could probably agree that if a symptomatic pediatric case comes into clinic and they exhibit what we would term rightly or wrongly a flat foot we would probably intervene in some way shape or form and have a justification for doing so and it's the asymptomatic, I think, where the real grey area, the real debate, uh, you know, we lean on the literature, we lean on our experience and, and we, we have beliefs and things. Um, so many questions on this. And where should we start? Let's start with, I know Simon, uh, I can see Simon Spooner has just uh, 
logged on to watch because he said he likes my hat and that's okay thank you simon <laughs> and um, he uh he has he actually texted me earlier and asked me a great question which i'll, I'll pitch to you now which is it, oh it, it was actually actually more about the asymptomatics now that i look down at my notes but i'm going to ask it anyway and that is what familial uh, factors should we be considering and should we be asking about and what you know, what, what are the sort of gems that you can give people to, to take into their clinic to, to ask during the history taking that might give us, uh, as you refer to it, the, the crystal ball into, crystal into ball. the future? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, and, you know, the crystal ball, it's, uh, yeah, there's your evidence-based um, intervention, isn't it, based on a crystal ball. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I always like it. I've got a family that I'm seeing at the moment, and um, the eldest child had uh has quite a flat foot posture um and to be honest we monitored him uh probably a little too long as it turned out because now he's got a bit of knee pain and and a few other issues happening um so for him his younger brother who's got almost the identical foot shape we're considering whether or not you know we're certainly at the moment just being conservative with shoe wear but he'll be some body that I look after uh, probably a little bit uh, more regularly than his brother. Um, so the older brother or the older siblings are always a great indicator. Um, but I always talk about a case a couple of years ago uh, where I had a mother come in with a child who all intents and purposes was typically developing quite asymp um, asymptomatic but he did complain of tired feet and his mum was relentless. And I always use this as a case study with when I talk to students about how fallible we all can be because she managed to talk me into dispensing a pair of prefabs to her child for reasons that I'm still not clear about. Uh, but partly because she had such a shocking time with her feet as an adult and constantly felt tired. She got hold of a pair of orthotics and they were fairly rotten orthotics. I have to tell you, they were, you know, some, um, I think she bought it out of a catalog. You no, know, one of those catalogs that come to home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, they look to me like as, as dodgy as they come, but she was in awe of them. And she had then progressed and, and um, she came back and saw me and got a set of, of uh, you know, slightly better, uh, more sturdy prefabs herself. And she's loved it. She's felt so much better. So her push, I could understand where her push was coming from, but I really, at, at the time when I dispensed these prefabs to the kid, kind of went, I'm basing this on nothing more than what mum is telling me may or may not happen in the future. And then the big PS to that story was about four or five years later in conversation, I was chatting away to her and um, it turns out that that's not her child at all. She called, he, she had, <laughs> she is actually her sister's <laughs> was still in the family, but she's raising that kid as her own um, because her, her sister had given birth to him when she was quite young. So she'd taken on this kid as her own um, and that kid did not know that. So that's why it never come up in the history taking. Um, and, uh, but I did laugh because I thought even my, my, you know, my thought process of, of clinging to the fact that there was some familial fatigue um, really went out the window at that point. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good one, isn't it? Because it, it, it is, the, they come in and they're not symptomatic and we immediately, our heart sinks. And then they tell us that an older sibling with very similar feet has had numerous problems and it gives us that little ray of light that we can say, well, now I've got my rationale for, for doing something. What if they're the oldest sibling? What if what if there's no family history? We're back in that grey area, aren't we? And um... we, really, we really are. And just importantly, just to take a step back, um, when we're prescribing for flat feet, there is, of course, a, um, a reliable tool, which is Angela Evans' paediatric flat foot proforma. Um, and they've looked at that for consistency and reliability. Um, and uh, that does list in there around some family history. And the same with the Delphi study that we did recently that came out um, in P PJ, we looked at a little bit more, when we talk about symptomatic, we actually expanded that symptomatic to involve things like um, fatigue. I think fatigue is one of those, thank you, one, uh, fatigue is one of those really underrated symptoms in children and something we hear all the time when you deal with kids uh, because I think fatigue is a precursor potentially to problems later on. And that's part of that longitudinal study that we want to do. We want to see if the kids that are reported either by their parents or self-reported now as tired um or their legs are tired you know are they the ones that we see you know suddenly at 9 10 11 or 12 becoming a bit more problematic or a bit more symptomatic so yeah it's, yeah. it's a real gray area and i wish i had a um uh, you know magic formula for it yeah. but what i will say is have a really good look at um 
at the pro forma that came out of that PJ thing for what the symptoms are because it's a little bit beyond pain and it does involve things like what does mum and dad um, you know suffer if anything with their feet what problems have they had um, and also again that kind of suck it and see if you do a low dye taping on these kids um, and get them to do some more single leg raises can they suddenly get through more in 10 seconds than they were before they they were taped um, and and I use that test a lot in kids um, in pediatrics I always say pediatrics has more to do with rehab uh, than it does with adult biomechanics for that purpose because I think the one thing that we can do with kids is sort of you know put in an intervention and reassess much like you would with with um, when you're doing a rehab um, and and you know just see if you can improve things yeah. I mean, Helen, the approach I've always taken is the, is the line in the sand approach down one end, you know, you've got the symptomatic painful foot. Yes. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the asymptomatic, you've got, you know, say one end, you've got really mild, no symptoms, siblings and parents are fine. Down the other end of the asymptomatic, you've got, um, it's severe in appearance. Um, the parents may have, uh, symptomatic problems. So the decision to intervene is somewhere on that line in the sand. Yes. And different professions have different positions on that line in the sand, different people within the same profession. And to me, it's all about where's that line in the sand. Yeah. And I think that's what we're trying to, that's what we need to achieve as a profession is trying to work out where is, you know, based on evidence or based on best practice, where does that, where is that line going to be drawn for all of us? And I think we're not there yet. Yeah. So I, I was at a, a conference a number of years ago um, in which there's two presenters on pediatric flat foot and one gave what I thought was a really good, thorough, systematic, evidence-based review of the literature. And I, I, I thought it was well done. The second presenter literally put his hand on his heart and said, we have to treat them all. And if we don't, we're condemning them to a lifelong of, and then proceeded to talk about, you know, for this foot, you do this modification for that foot, you do this modification. And I was sitting down the back and, and I was quite gobsmacked at how many people took notes during the evidence-based presentation, um, which was pretty much no one and how furiously people were taking notes during the, the intervention side of the coin. And I was just sort of, whoa, what is going on here? Like it was, yeah, I, I was somewhat disheartened. <laughs> And that, yeah, that is, that is disheartening, isn't it? I think I'm hoping that things are changing because I know how much I've changed my practice methods in, in the 20 odd years since I graduated. Um, and, and you do hope that it's, it's moving on. But yes, unfortunately, as you say, there's, there's lots of people in this profession in every profession and, um, and trying to get everybody on board can be a little bit tricky. Yeah. But it may, maybe the time to raise this, and I know I've raised this in previous chats we've had with people on paediatrics, is this do something-ism oh, issue. Yes. And I, I know, you know, reassurance is doing something, but I, I've always had this fear, and I, I think it's come to reality at times, that if I see someone, yep, you're fine within normal limits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if I don't do something, they will then go and find someone who will do something. And that someone may or may not be, in my opinion, unethical in the intervention they use. And I, I always find that a chat that, that, you know, doing something so they don't go and do that. But yeah. I, I agree with you. And I, um, I obviously teach at the university and we have quite a few people come and seek second opinions. And sometimes I'm a bit horrified. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those areas. And as um, Ian was saying um, before we came on as parents, sometimes you know, you, you take your child somewhere and you do want an outcome for them. And we've all left, you know, as a parent and, and sort of gone, well, they didn't really tell me much or didn't really do much. Um, and so I think a lot of it is around ex managing the expectations of the parents. I have a couple of sheets that I use in practice that kind of get whipped out pretty quick and, and are really just dot points on this is what we, what orthotics are known to do in children. Um, and this is what orthotics are known to do in adults because, um, you know, I talk a lot about balance is my big thing. Balance and stability is a really big deal for me around, um, you know, hypermobile kids and whatever else. So I have a couple of things. Keith Rome did a beautiful study uh, years ago in adults that looked at how much sway they had with and without orthotics. And we can reduce the amount of sway they do. So, you know, I have a whole sort of, um, of stack of those and I pull them out and just sort of tick for mum and say, look, you know, you they're flat-footed, but the reality is they're not 
unbalanced. They're not, um, you know, they're not, they're, they're, their ankle is above their foot. It's not going sideways and all that kind of stuff and just tick through it. Um, but I don't doubt for a second, Craig, I, I know I, I talk about it all the time about the people that I have probably potentially treated like the one I was talking about before that may not have needed it. And I'm also sure that I've not treated kids that have walked down the road um, and, and as you say, probably gotten a very expensive, um, second opinion. Yeah. I, I mean, no matter what you say to them, they are going to go home and Google it. Oh yes. <laughs> and they will find what they want to find. And you know, and it, then it comes down as to why would they believe you over something they read on the internet? Yes. You and I know the answer to that, but you know, with this, this, um, it actually just as a slight slide track, it reminds me of that study. A year or so ago, on it looked at just a qualitative study looking at a group of runners, and it pretty much concluded that runners were more trusting of anecdotes from fellow runners than they were of health professionals. Um, you know, they, they they will go to their Facebook group to get medical advice, and they'll trust that more than they will us, which was a little scary. It's really there was there was a study that came out years ago. You probably know of it, Craig, that said that we will use alternative medicines. We will spend as much on alternative medicines as we will on evidence-based medicines, yeah. and not only that, but we won't expect as much from them. Mm. So not only are we willing to spend the money, yeah. we also are willing to cut them a lot more slack than what we yeah. will anything evidence-based. So yes, I think we're battling a bit there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it comes under the umbrella of beliefs yes. and, and um, humans <laughs> and nature with it when it comes to their own beliefs. I'm just going to, I know I, I briefly told you this story for like a little bit of mini therapy for me just before we went live, Helen, but I'm just going to mention it just because I'm, I'm hopeful, or at least I think I'm right in saying that there'll be lots of people out there that probably went through the clinical scenario that I went through recently. And that was a fairly textbook thing where some parents brought in a, a young girl, she, well, she was sort of 12, 13. She was a classic sort of 12, 13 year old. She was very sporty. Um, she was very sort of going through a growth spurt, a bit uncoordinated, sort of bigger, uh, sort of uh, valgus knees, very hypermobile. She was completely asymptomatic, mm -hmm. but at foot, at foot level, she was, she was, you know, markedly pronated and, and the parents were horrified by this posture uh, coming into their beliefs and what they'd read and what they believed. And, um, and they, they pretty much brought her to me for, not for an opinion, not for, for an assessment. They brought her for orthoses. That was kind of the opening, the opening gambit. That was how it was opened up. And I immediately, with my clinician hat on, thought to myself, okay, how am I going to, and I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to break down these beliefs and get them to build a rapport, get them to trust me and, and reassure them that, that this is okay and it's normal and part of development and she's asymptomatic and she's functioning at a good level. And then I got her on the, the treadmill as part of the analysis and I was looking at these feet and watching them. And for some reason, I, and I, I don't know why, the clinician within me just disappeared. And, and I sort of floated off into this place where I was thinking as a, as, as a parent myself. Mm -hmm. And although my two boys are, are much younger, they're three and five, for some reason, I just found myself, while she was habituating to the treadmill, entertaining the idea of what I might do if this was one of my boys when they were... 12 or 13 and they were very sporty and I have absolutely no, even with my clinician hat on this side of the head sort of knowing or having a reasonable understanding of the the evidence base the literature the science behind it my father head my father hat on this side of my head sorry I'm looking at these feet and I'm saying to myself uh, and I can't justify why but I'm just saying to myself if this is either of my boys I'm giving them a device yeah. and then I had this then I had this discourse in my own head. Obviously, I haven't verbalized this to the, to the parents, but I had this discourse of if this is the way I would treat my own child, mm -hmm. is it not the way I should treat someone else's child? And it was a really uncomfortable. This all probably happened within about three minutes or so, but it was a really uncomfortable three minutes. And I just I guess I need some reassurance that even people of your caliber go through this as well. All the time. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> All the time, and um, and and I, to 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 make you feel really better, I work really closely at, at, um, at develop therapies here in Adelaide. We have a uh, it's predominantly NDIS, as I said earlier. So every child comes in with a diagnosis. Every child um, has has quite special needs, and I work quite closely with the physio. And the amount of whispered conversations we have at the other end of the gate lab, kind of going. <laughs> 
Right. Well, um, <laughs> this kid, well, she's a bit asymmetrical. You know, like we're trying to to justify what we want to do in the absence of of really having something to to stick a pin in. Um, and uh, and as I say, with that that article that we did, we did flesh out a few of those symptoms to, to kind of cater in for that. But there are times where I'm sure if you put me in front of the panel of my colleagues and said, right, Helen, justify why you did that, um, I'd really struggle with that. And partly I think it comes down to that kind of gut feeling where you go, okay, there's nothing specific, but maybe it's on the edge of specific. You know, maybe it's on the edge of where I would be comfortable treating and um, and erring on potentially the side of caution. Um, I think what we the one thing that we're lacking as a, as a profession is actually around the do no harm thing. We actually don't know if we do any harm when we intervene. And I like to think we don't. Um, but I do think that again, great study for anybody that's out there um, brave enough. Um, but I do think, uh, you know, sort of looking at kids that have had long-term orthotics and doing a really good retrospective or prospective study on, on what orthotics can do in a negative sense would make us feel a bit better. Um, you know, hopefully, uh, about those grey areas because I struggle with them too. So if you're in that position, yeah. call me because I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll confuddle your brain as well. We can sit and confuddle yeah. each other because I stare at it sometimes and I think, I, you know, yes, yes, I do, I do. And you want to, and particularly with those really hypermobile feet, I just think, oh, just stand still. So, you know, um, um, yeah, I wish and I could. I think, a, a I think it then helps us when we get the pushy, the, not pushy is a negative word. I don't mean to sound negative, negative, but we get the anxious parent, the, the parent really sort of uh, firmly pushing us. Um, I think it helps us to understand where they're coming from because, you know, um, we, we've all got that within ourselves, assuming we're parents. And then the, the inevitable question that I know we've asked of Kylie and Alicia and Nina, and, and we'll ask it again, because I think you can just never have too many tips on this is how do you deal with those those parents because you sort of understand them but at the same time they're being a bit pushy and you're the clinician and there's you know a, a, any 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 clinical pearls for the sort of dealing with the the pushy parent who you think might be over medicalizing their completely normal child yeah and um and i i have i have been on both sides of these i've, I've freely confessed earlier that i've treated someone i didn't think i should um <laughs> i have had a bit of pushback um, with parents occasionally. And um, I must admit, I felt like such a wanker for doing it. But I did pull out the PhD <laughs> one day. I did kind of, you know, um, trust me, I'm a doctor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and even that got me nowhere. Uh, so I, I find, I refer to that, you, the pushy parent. I have this picture in my head of a couple of, of parents. And, and um, I always terribly sexist of me when they're women i always think they're bolshy broads and i love a bolshy broad except when i'm trying to do battle at the counter with her um but the only thing you can do again is try and manage their expectations against the evidence and um i had it recently with my own daughter we went to see a, an orthodontist and we'd been to the first one who was going to put plates and whatever else in and for reasons that it was just too far away we went to someone closer and he completely reversed what the other one was going to do and he did it in such a beautiful way that i nodded agreed left and felt brilliant and afterwards i tried to pull that apart in my head to how did he just reverse you know this is my daughter as you say it's it's your future. You kind of want everything best for them. And I thought, how did I feel really good about that? And, and I think what that he did that I'm going to try and mimic is really just stay very, very calm about the whole thing and say, look, this is one option, but the evidence suggests that if we do this and monitor it, you know, if we just leave this and monitor it until they get to this point, we will have a much better understanding of any intervention that is required. Um, and really just around managing the expectations of what orthotics can do. Uh, and he just kind of laid it out for me for what a plate will and won't do um, and kind of gave me the future on within two minutes about this is what was most likely to happen. And I think what we need to do is monitor until this point and then we'll have a better idea. And I think that's the thing I'm going to say now. So, you know, they're 10, so they've got a, a, a puberty's coming up. They're going to get a bit more gene of algum. Why don't we monitor them until they're 12 and then we'll have a better idea of whether or not it's something we need to think about. 
That's my um, yeah. stolen pearl of wisdom from the orthodontist. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had a couple of questions that I'll just quickly pull back to because I think they're, they're worth they're worth asking. One from, um, I hope I pronounced this name correct, apologies if I don't, Hil Hillel, um, who asked, with regard to asking about sort of siblings and parents, do you ever go as far back as asking about grandparents? Yes, yes absolutely. I really do. Right. Because, um, I think, again, it's that crystal ball. If you've got a child, and of course, we're not all replicas of our parents, but we're 50-50 of each parent. Um, so if you've got a child and then you've got, you know, an older sibling is great, a parent is great, but Nana and Granddad, they're, you know, potentially 50, 60, 70, 80 years down the track. And so their experiences, while complete, you know, we're a history of our use. We're not just a skeleton born, um, but they at least give us some idea of, of what potentially may be occurring. So yes, I very much look at, at Nana and Granddad, particularly around juvenile HIV, um, because you know you see that running in families so often. Um, but for flat foot even, if you, if you can see Nana has got that really rigid adult acquired flat foot thing happening, then you, know, you might think a little bit more about how closely you monitor if nothing else. Great. And the second question was from Ashley and they asked, I say they because I'm not sure if that's male or female, huge apologies there, but Ashley asked, um, what's the youngest age that you uh, consider intervening with respect to foot orthoses? I'm sure that's a common question that, that gets thrown at you as well. It is a common, and unfortunately, again, there's no, there's, um, there's not a magic age. I look at it more about a size um, and weight. So for me, and we did actually do um, ask in the, the uh, and I can't remember exactly what the outcome was, but to be 100% honest, I'm not good at judging weight in children anyway. So I have a tendency to look at a kid and think if, I'm, if I can't hold that foot up with minimal, you know, uh, finger strength, if I can't kind of move that foot, um, and again, that transverse plane stuff, if I can't kind of move that foot with, without a lot of, pressure from me then a wedge isn't going to do it um but if i've got you know they could be six seven if they're tiny very light kids and you know a bit of finger pressure moves that foot over then i'd probably more likely use a bit of a wedge or a um a, a nice solid shoe uh over an orthotic um and again it, it 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 depends what they're presenting for but yeah not a specific age in typically developing children i don't think i'd go you know if i had to put an age on it, i don't think i'd go much younger than five or six but again, completely dependent on size. Yeah. So as always, there's no answer. It's it no. depends. Uh, plus clinical reasoning. Yeah. For yeah exactly. Actually, we just had a, had a really interesting question just come in in from Mark Barton, and it's worth thinking about. And if you you reflect back on all our previous episodes and what we know now about nocebic language and how the language we use can harm people, his question wasn't about that. But his question was about: Is there a worry if we prescribe an orthosis in an asymptomatic child? they rely on it and never give up. Now that would be the ultimate nasebic orthotic. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that term used before, but... Um... <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, I, I guess it depends, how it's, it depends how it's sold for me. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, we, I think we'd, we'd, we'd see that in, we'd see that in adults. And I, oh. I, my gut feeling, and you, I don't know, Helen, correct me if I'm wrong, because you see an awful lot more peds than me, but... I see adults that are very attached to orthoses or not. They're very pro or, or against, you know, Marmite or Vegemite, I should say. Um, yes. Just yes. because, probably because of the way it was pitched to them, what they were promised it, it did do and it didn't do. And, and um, I don't believe, or I might be wrong in thinking, but I don't believe that kids probably carry that with them through childhood. Maybe they do, but maybe it's their parents who are probably in the room when they, the devices are first issued mm -hmm. and they're told you need these to correct you or to realign you, you know, all the kind of terms that we now know are probably poor. And, and then and I, I'm sure we've all seen someone in their twenties that says I've had these since I was eight. Yes. Um, and, and is it just habit? Is it, is it dependence? I think there's an awful lot to unpick there, isn't there? And um, there, it, I don't have any. I don't have any answers myself, but no, yeah, it's a great question. I am. Um, uh, I find children that have got. I hate using the term sensory processing disorders. I think you know we we all process sensation differently, and there's it's a bit of a spectrum. But if you talk about those kids that are further along that spectrum, I find a lot of them um, once they they have 
um, I, I can think of a, quite a few kids that I've been seeing for a long time. They're really a bit loath to get up, give up their orthotics. And I think it's just that it's an arch fill for them, that they're, that, the sensation of having something constantly under their foot is actually reassuring. Um, and, and it's quite interesting to watch them walk without their orthotics in because they feel like they're in midair. Um, so I think there's, you know, I think all of us are on that, that spectrum somewhere. So some kids, I, I, I do think, like the sensation more than, than um, necessarily require the orthotics. Uh, but if it, you know, I had a kid there, the other day that was a toe walker um, and um, popped a set of orthotics in him. And of course it, the ground didn't go away. He put his, he went up on his toes and the ground stayed under his arch because the orthotic was pushing in there. And within literally a few minutes, you could see his heels just come straight down. Um, and we're following up tomorrow on Saturday morning. I've got to see him again. Um, but I spoke to his mum the other day and she's been thrilled because he's suddenly walking on these heels. Um, so yeah, you know, there's lots of different stuff happening, isn't there around that, um, mm. uh, around foot orthotics that we don't really completely understand, but I like that nociceptic. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to use that one. <laughs> so I, um, I've been, this is going to sound weird, but I'm just going to, I'm, I've been writing up a sort of doctoral research proposal for a doctoral. I'm not yet doing, by the way, this is, this is the way my mind works. And, and I really want to do something on orthoses and some of the psychosocial sort of considerations. And actually just something you said there, I'm literally frantically scribbling it down. It's not even an idea yet, but I wonder if the, we could get groups of people that have had orthoses since childhood and just kind of uh, qualitatively unpick their beliefs about them. And I'm, just, I'm literally thinking out loud, I'm writing it while, while it's in my head. Um, <laughs> There's no question here. Sorry, ignore me. I'm, I'm no, blabbering. Um, before I forget, Gus um, Abbas Mosley did a master's thesis. Uh, oh, must be 15, 20 years ago now. Maybe not that long. Um, looking at people's perceptions mm. of uh, their orthoses. So yeah, I, Gus... Um, I vaguely recall um, it, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I, remember can that? You, I do remember can it. You, yeah, um, it yeah. Can you email that to me after the I show? Oh. <laughs> the name, the name, because you said, I don't know. Or just email me the name and I'll do the search, but I don't know how to spell that name. So, yeah. He's, he's yeah, an Adelaide that's... pod. I, um, he, he teaches for us occasionally, so I'll tackle him in the hallway. <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. Thank you. I knew it was worth doing these things for a reason. Um, is there anything else? We, how are we doing for time, Craig? No, I think we're just, uh, we're, just, we're just about out of time. You notice I've found a way to stop the dog barking. <laughs> oh, look at that. Well, no, no, no. the actual dog's it's, really it's, only, it's been one whole year. Yeah. The dog's been barking every single episode. In episode 52, you, you yeah. pick it up and put it on your lap. Well, no, <laughs> there's a bit of a story this week. This, the, the dog's actually a twin. And <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> this, wow. Yeah. No, the dog... The dog we talked the, about dogs. The, dog, the dog's actually a twin, and her sister died last weekend, so she's really, really sad. So that's why I've picked her up. Oh. Yeah, so she's lost her sister a week ago, and she's been lying on her back, staring up at the ceiling. And yeah, it's. She's still in yeah. the show now. She's still in oh. the show. Um, she really is. She's so I think perfect. on that note, I think we, we, let's, let's wind up. We've gone for almost an hour. So look, thanks so much, Helen. It's been really, thanks, really Helen. good. Thanks, um, Helen. So. Um, for those of you who've just joined, you know, hopefully, hopefully the video will be on Facebook in about 10 minutes. We did lose last week's for some bizarre reason. If not, it will be on YouTube later today. So, so again, thanks again, everybody.